bow our heads for prayer. Father in heaven, thank you for the privilege that we have of um, openly worshiping and learning of you. I pray that your spirit would guide us as we look at some of the, uh, the things, uh, as the concepts as we try to understand you uh, better and more. And I pray that your Holy Spirit would give us the clear thinking that we need. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Um, last time we looked at the libertarian freedom worldview, and we dealt with some of the objections that determinism has or makes toward this libertarian freedom view. Libertarian freedom is an indeterminist view, which means that we believe, do not believe that God predetermines everything, but that we have the free will to make our own choices. Now, there are other strains of indeterminism that also object to libertarian freedom views. And it's not just de the determinists, the, the predestination group that has objections. There are some that are not predestination group that still object to some things about libertarian freedom. On the first day, I talked just briefly about um, open, well, actually talked a lot about open theism, but how they have some objections as well. So we're going to look a little bit at, at specifically why open theism uh, hat takes issue with the libertarian freedom worldview. Open theism, even though it agrees that God does not determine our every choice, also says that God does not know what choices you and I are going to make because there's no such thing as divine foreknowledge. They do not accept the idea of divine foreknowledge. The, the, the future simply cannot be known in their view. So far as I know, they don't point to any scriptural references for this objection to for God's foreknowledge. Their objections are more based in logic. God cannot know something that hasn't happened yet, and it's ridiculous to expect for God to know the future. It's not that God is not all-powerful. He is. It's just that an, even an all-powerful being cannot accomplish a mutually exclusive task. It would be like asking him to speak out loud and be silent at the same time. It's just, it's a ridiculous proposition. And if we were to reason from a strictly logical point of view, this would be a strong objection. However, we don't begin with logic, do we? We begin with God's revelation of himself. We must first look at what God has told us about himself and then begin our reasoning from there. So how do we answer open theism's objections? We begin by pointing to the scriptures. And here are just a few passages that show that God's foreknowledge is a biblical concept. Romans 11.2 says God did not reject his people whom he foreknew. Acts 2.23, this man was handed over to you by God's set purpose and for knowledge. 1 Peter 1.20, uh, he, for he was foreknown before the foundation of the world. Romans 8.29, for those God foreknew, he also predestined and conformed to the likeness of his son that he might be the firstborn of many Brothers, this, this Greek word that's translated foreknew or foreknown in these verses is proegno, which means to know beforehand. It's where we get our word prognosis, which, which is a prognosis is when a doctor makes a, a uh, prediction about what's going to happen, right? Prognosis. So that's the Greek word in the background, proegno. Over and over again in Scripture, that word is assigned to God for knowledge. And here's one more indication, different word, but another indication of God's foreknowledge. Jesus told his disciples in John chapter 3, verse 19, I am telling you now, before it happens, so that when it does happen, you will believe that I am he. So there's 
divine foreknowledge. The Bible points towards God's foreknowledge. Another reason that foreknowledge is biblical is that God himself says that divine foreknowledge is one of the primary things that qualifies him to be God. Divine foreknowledge is a qualification for being God. Isaiah 41, 21 to 24 He says, present your case, says the Lord. Set forth your arguments, says Jacob's king. Bring in your idols to tell us what is going to happen so that we may consider them and know their final outcome or declare to us the things to come. Tell us what the future holds so that we may know that what? You are God's. That's one of the things you have to be able to do to, to, is to be able to tell the future, to qualify, to be God. Here's another one. These are a couple of long ones here. Oh, I, I went on too far there. Okay, this is what the Lord says. Israel's King and Redeemer, the Lord Almighty, I am the first and I am the last. Apart from me, there is no God. Who then is like me? Let him proclaim it. Let him declare and lay out before me what has happened since I established my ancient people. What is yet to come? Yes, let him foretell what will come. Do not tremble, do not be afraid, and so forth. So according to God's revelation of himself, in order to qualify to be God, one must be able to tell with accuracy the past as well as the future. Oh, I skipped, uh, I skipped um, one of these here, Isaiah chapter 46 verses 9 to 11. Remember the former things, those of long ago. I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is none like me. I make known the end from the beginning, from ancient times, what is still to come. I say, my purpose will stand and I will do all that I please. So in order to qualify as God, one must be able to tell with accuracy the past as well as the future. Remove that capability from God and he is no longer qualified to be God. Okay, that's a pretty good answer, isn't it, to open theist objections? And then there is Bible prophecy. If God has no foreknowledge, you have to explain away an awful lot of Bible prophecy, don't you? How could God give King Nebuchadnezzar and Daniel dreams about what kingdom would follow another kingdom? How could God give John the book of Revelation predicting what would happen at the end of time? How, how could God tell Isaiah 150 years early that a man named Cyrus was going to show up on the scene? How could he do that if he doesn't have divine foreknowledge? So we just saw three reasons why we should believe in God's foreknowledge. The Bible says he has foreknowledge. Foreknowledge is a qualification for being God, and prophecy would be impossible without divine foreknowledge. If we accept the Bible as our authority, then God knows the future. He has foreknowledge. Those who deny God's foreknowledge will sometimes argue that divine foreknowledge makes free will impossible. The fact that God pre-knows what choices I'm going to make, they say, actually determines what choice I'm going to make. It means I don't have free choice because God already knows. But why would that have to be so? If I give a child a piece of candy, I can predict what he's going to do with it with some pretty good accuracy, right? Does that mean the child does not have the choice to do other than I expect? No, the child is still perfectly free to do otherwise, even though I know what he's going to do. He is no less free by the fact that I know what he's going to do. No less free. Those who deny the possibility of God's foreknowledge will ask for an explanation. If, as you say, God knows the future, how can he know it since it's not yet happened? How is that possible? To the libertarian freedom, the person that... that, um, understands libertarian freedom, we're perfectly comfortable replying to that question, I don't know. (laughs) Did you know that I don't know is a legitimate response to people asking questions? 
<laughs> I don't know is a perfectly legitimate, le legitimate response. There's actually a lot that I don't know about God. I don't know how he can be all-powerful. I don't know how he can be everywhere at the same time. I don't understand that. I don't know really much at all about God when you think about it. And I don't know how he can know the future. But I do know what he has revealed to us in the Bible, and I trust him. If he says he knows the future, then I believe he knows the future. Some people would call that naivete. <laughs> God calls it faith. For libertarian freedom, this is fundamental as how God operates. God does not predetermine our choices. He really does allow us to make our own choices, but he knows beforehand what choices I will make, and he's able to plan accordingly. This is all going to figure into the great controversy theme that we're going to be talking about the last day. And this is also very important to understand because in this worldview, God doesn't always get what he wants. His rebellious creatures actually do choose against him all of the time. So how can he run his government? How can God be in control of the universe when anybody can do anything that they want, whether God likes it or not? And how could God promise that it's all going to work out in the end? If our government went that direction and said, Everybody can do whatever they want. It would result in chaos, right? How can God do this? The reason is because he uses his divine foreknowledge to counteract our bad choices. He uses it. Because of his foreknowledge, he is able to say that he works all things together for good for those who love him and are called according to his purposes. So on the one hand, God doesn't always get what he wants. But in the end... He always accomplishes his purposes. Therefore, we need to make a differentiation, a distinction between two aspects of God's will. God has his ideal will and he has his effective will. God knows the way that things ought to go. He knows every choice that we ought to make, and it is his ideal will that we would make those good choices. That's what he wants. That's his ideal will. That is what he would prefer, but God doesn't often get his ideal will because we sabotage it. We make choices other than what he would like for us to do, so God then instead goes to his effective will will. All right, if that's the choice you're going to make, then here's my will at this point, considering the new circumstances. And if we again make a bad choice, God has yet another option, considering those new circumstances, and another, and another, and another. He has a thousand ways his, way, his miracles to perform, right? And eventually, the Bible tells us, that he will accomplish his purposes. And what are his purposes? His primary purpose, while sin is still alive anyway, is to bring an end to the rebellion started by Satan and to be reconciled with as much of his creation as will accept reconciliation with him. God's ultimate plan is to bring the entire universe including this planet, back into the kingdom of God, meanwhile rescuing as many as will accept rescuing. That's God's primary purpose while sin is alive. The natural question here is, why is God going to all this trouble? He's God. Why doesn't he just fix it? Why doesn't he always get what he wants? He knows the best. Why doesn't he simply arrange things that way? And that is the million dollar question. And there's a good, very good answer. The answer is far better than the determinist answer, which says, God always does get what he wants. That's the way they answer. 
God always gets what he wants because he makes it happen. The, re- the fact that it's happening, that means he wants it. The reason God doesn't always get what he wants is because that is the risk of leadership based in love rather than fear or power or anything else. The reason God does not always get what he wants is because that is the risk of leadership that is based in love instead of power or anything else. Else. To put it another way, when a leader out of love gives his followers free will, he risks that they will not choose to follow him, and they may even choose to fight against him. That's the risk such a leader takes. This is the risk that God took in creating free-willed creatures in the universe, and he has not yet changed his mind about the wisdom of his course of action. God knows that a government based on love and freedom is the only eternal, eternally sustain, uh, uh, sustainable government. God knows that a government based on love and freedom is the only eternally sustainable government. It's all about love. Love is the reason that God does not force everything to go precisely the way he wants it to go, and love is the reason that God ultimately is going to bring things around the way that he knows it must be in order for his government to continue for eternity on the basis of love. Therefore, the love of God is something that deserves a great deal of exploration. Now, once again, we can't just start guessing at what God's love is like. We have to begin with God's revelation to us in order to understand what His love is all about. We find at least five different aspects of God's love in Scripture. And you're going to need your sheets here again with the words on it. His love is volitional, emotional, evaluative, for conditional and ideally reciprocal. Now, if you don't know what I just said, that's all right. I didn't either the first time I heard them. <laughs> that's why I gave you the sheet. We'll talk about each one, okay? The first element that we see of God's love in Scripture is that God does not have to love us. His nature is love, But still, God is able to choose whom he will love. God's love is volitional. It's voluntary. No one is forcing God to love us. Okay, that was what volitional means. God did not create us because he needed love. He already had love before creating the world. We know that from John chapter 17, 24, that Jesus already had a relationship of love with the Father before the creation of the world, right? Father, I want those who you have given to me to be with me where I am and to see my glory, the glory you have given me because you loved me before the creation of the world. God had love already. He didn't need us. He wants us voluntarily. He chooses to love us. God's love is volitional, voluntary. Here's another text. The reason my Father loves me is that I lay down my life. This is Jesus talking. Only to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of what? Of my own accord. He does it voluntarily. Hosea 14.4 says, I will heal their waywardness and love them, how? Freely for my anger has turned away from him. God doesn't have to love you. He wants to love you. God's love is volitional. It's voluntary. He chooses to love us. Okay, that's the first one. The next element we see is that God, in Scripture, is that God's love is emotional. And I'm not using the word emotional like we often use it today. Um, like wearing your emotions on your sleeve or something that God is weepy all the time. That's not what we're talking about. Emotional. Remember, one of the classical assumptions about God is that he's impassable. We talked about that the first couple days, right? 
God is impassable. That means he does not experience emotion. He can't be affected by the things that are external to himself. But Scripture, we saw, reveals the opposite picture of God. For instance, God compares his love to the passionate love between a husband and wife. Look at this one. Go and proclaim in the hearing of Jerusalem, I remember the devotion of your youth. How as a bride you loved me and followed me through the desert, through a land not sown. God compares his love to a passionate love between a husband and a wife. And we're not going to look up all of these texts, but here are a few more, and you have them on your sheet, of texts where God compares his love to us with that of lovers. Okay, so that's just one aspect of it. God also compares his love to the, uh, the affection of a parent. It was I who taught Ephraim to walk, taking them by the arms, and they did not realize that, that it was I who healed them. I led them with cords of human kindness, with ties of love. I lifted the yoke from their neck, and I bent down to feed them. God describes his love of us for us as that of a parent. And then there's a whole bunch more passages where he does the same thing. God also reveals his love as compassionate and merciful. This is Exodus 34, 6, and 7. It's sometimes called the John 3, 16 of the Old Testament. And he passed in front of Moses proclaiming, The Lord, the Lord, compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands and forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin. Yet he does not leave the guilty unpunished. He punishes the children and their children for the sin of the fathers to the third and fourth generation. So, and there are other passages that illustrate God's love as compassionate and merciful. Here's a whole bunch of them. There are a few... Uh, want to look them up later. God also reveals his love as jealous, zealous, and passionate. Joel 2.18 Then the Lord will be jealous for his land and take pity on his people. And we're going to talk about God's jealousy a bit more later. But that's, here's some other verses where he describes his love as jealous. Um, whatever you want to think of jealousy, it's definitely an emotional aspect of, of God's love. Uh, all of these are examples of the emotive aspect of God's love. In other words, God feels. God feels. There are emotions at work in here. God experiences not only positive emotions, though. God also experiences negative emotions. Genesis 6, 6, the Lord was grieved. We looked at this one yesterday. The Lord was grieved that he had made man on the earth and his heart was filled with pain. Okay, those are negative things that God was experiencing. Deuteronomy 6, 15, for the Lord your God who is among you is a jealous God and his anger will burn against you and he will destroy you from the face of the land. So here are negative ones and here's some texts with more negative emotional responses from God. Among the negative emotions experienced by God are the emotions of hatred and wrath. Even people who accept that God experiences and displays positive emotions are sometimes uncomfortable with the idea of God's hatred and his wrath. Because in our world, these emotions are equated with sinful behavior. Does God have sinful behavior sometimes? No. Hatred and wrath are behaviors that can have a legitimate aspect to them. Notice in these verses what God is hating and why he is angry. Okay, Isaiah 61. See what, he's, what he is hating and why he is angry. For I, the Lord, love justice. I hate robbery and iniquity. In my faithfulness, I will reward them and make an everlasting covenant with them. So what does he, what does he hate? He hates robber, robbery and iniquity. Another one here, Psalm 45, 7. You love righteousness and hate wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has set above you, set you above your companions by anointing you with the oil of joy. So God is hating evil. He is angry over things that cause pain to those he loves, correct? Anybody think that God should like those things? No. There are legitimate aspects to hating and wrath. Note, however, that God's negative emotions are never, ever arbitrary. 
His hatred is very narrowly defined because it always is prompted by evil happening. Remember how we described God's hatred last time. It has a broad range of meaning in the Bible and it includes the contrast between two things that a person loves. Remember I said I love both peaches and apples, but if I have to choose one over the other, I could legitimately say... I love peaches, I hate apples. I could legitimately say that, and the next time I could say, I love apples and I hate peaches, because that's what I prefer. It has that range of meaning in the Bible. Hatred can be just preferring one thing over another. The word has that range of meaning in the Bible. Another way that the word is used regarding God is when he hates something because of the quality of that thing. Now, this is an important concept, because we're, we're going to deal with something that, that I remember when we went, got to this in the class, that definitely caused me to say, huh? Wait a minute. So, God also hates things because of the quality of that thing. So, I love good peaches, but I hate rotten peaches. It's not that I hate peaches in general, but I hate a particular peach because of its rottenness. Correct? If that, were, that peach were to change and no longer be rotten, then I wouldn't hate it anymore. Correct? That makes sense, right? God evidently loves and hates based on the behavior of his people. Whether or not I'm a good peach or a rotten peach. Now listen to the verses with that idea in mind. Jeremiah 12.8 my inheritance has become to me like a lion in the forest. She roars at me, therefore I hate her. Or Hosea 9:15. Because of all their wickedness in Gilgal, I hated them there. Because of their sinful deeds, I will drive them out of my house. I will no longer love them. All their leaders are rebellious. Psalm 5, 4 and 6. You are not a God who takes pleasure in evil. With you, the wicked cannot dwell. The arrogant cannot stand in your presence. You hate all who do wrong. You destroy those who tell lies. Bloodthirsty and deceitful men, the Lord abhors. Some strong language, isn't it? Hatred is God's holy response to evil. That kind of hatred is compatible with love, isn't it? Yes, it is. That kind of hatred is compatible with love. Just as hating rotten peaches is absolutely compatible with loving good ones. If a zucchini rots, I don't really care. Because I don't like zucchini in the first place, right? I hate it even when it's ripe. But a rotten peach is a real loss because I love peaches. It's, a, it's wickedness that God hates, and rightfully so. That's God's, that's God's hatred. What about God's wrath? God's wrath is another negative emotion that sometimes we're uncomfortable assigning to God. Why is God angry? God is angry because he abhors the suffering his creatures are inflicting on others. Here's an example, 2 Chronicles 33, 6. He sacrificed his sons in the fire in the valley of ben Hinnom, practiced sorcery, divination and witchcraft, consulted mediums and spirits, spiritists. He did much evil in the eyes of the Lord, provoking him to anger. Wrath is a proper response of love toward evil, right? Even though you love your son, wouldn't you feel wrath if he purposely hurt your daughter? Sure you would. Or even if he purposely hurt himself, you feel some wrath about that as well. You should feel some wrath about those kinds of things. If you don't, there's something wrong, correct? God should feel that way about those that are hurting others. Depending on the circumstances, wrath can be a proper, proper response of love. Everybody with me? 
Okay. Second Chronicles 36.16 says, They mocked God's messengers, despised His words, scoffed at His prophets, until the wrath of the Lord was aroused against His people and there was no remedy. So here we see that God is angry when we reject Him because He knows that in rejecting Him, we are destroying ourselves. So to say no to God, to reject God, makes God angry. Romans 2, 5. But because of your stubbornness and your unrepentant heart, you are storing up wrath against yourself for the day of God's wrath when His righteous judgment will be revealed. Colossians 3, 5 and 6. Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil, desires, greed, which is idolatry. Because of these, the wrath of God is coming. God is angry over evil behavior. Why? Because it is responsible for destroying those He loves. So He should be angry about them. Now, I always want to be careful on this topic about God's wrath because I have known people to use God's wrath to justify their bad temper. You ever met anybody like that? Well, God gets mad sometimes. Notice that God's wrath is anything but a bad temper. God's wrath is directed at evil, and His wrath is motivated by love. I have never met someone with a bad temper that is motivated by love. And what's more, God's wrath is always pre-planned. He never, ever goes off half-cocked. God tells His people that if they do such and such, His response is that He will get angry. You need to know that. It's the proper response. It's what I'm supposed to do. If you do this, I'm going to get angry. Deuteronomy 31, 17. On that day... This is him predicting it. On that day, I will become angry with them and forsake them. I will hide my face from them, and they will be destroyed. God is pre-planning his wrath. So when we look closely at God's wrath and his hatred, we see that they are motivated by his love, and in the end, nobody's going to have any question on that count. So this leads us to the next aspect of God's love that we see in Scripture. God's love is evaluative. His love is not indifferent. In other words, it's not disinterested. God is paying attention to, and He is evaluating our choices. He has to, right? If He's going to choose to love or to hate us based on our behavior and evil in us, then He is evaluating. That's another emotional aspect of God's love. It is evaluative. In the libertarian freedom model, God's, uh, God is indeterministic. That means he has not m- decided, he has not predecided your direction. He does not take control of every detail of his creation. He allows us to make choices. He does not always intervene to protect us from the consequences of our bad choices. Therefore, God's love has to be evaluative. In other words, he must evaluate our choices in order to decide how to proceed, right? Right? especially when it comes to who will be saved and who will be lost, God must evaluate our choices because that affects what He does. Determinism says that God arbitrarily decides who will be saved and who will be lost, and they point to a few verses that read alone and unexplored might seem to support that idea, but the overall picture in the Bible is different. God's love is evaluative. He looks at the situation, he looks at our choices, he looks at our behavior, and then he loves us or hates us based on what he sees. Are you starting to get a little bit uncomfortable with that language? Me too. Let's look at it. We need to be careful here because in one way of looking at it, God loves us unconditionally, right? In one way of looking at it, God loves us absolutely unconditionally. This is called God's subjective love. He loves all of His creation dearly, including those who reject Him. That kind of love is His nature. It is His default mode. 
So I want to be perfectly clear about that in one way of looking at it. God's love is absolutely unconditional. However, we also see in Scripture God's objective love in which he objectively considers the situation and then either loves or hates based on his evaluation of the situation. If he sees a good peach, he loves it. If he sees a rotten peach, he hates it. He has to. This does not change the underlying fact that his objective hatred, the, I'm sorry, this doesn't change the fact that underlying his objective hatred is his subjective love. That, that subjective, unconditional love is always there. In fact, it is the reason for his objective hatred. The reason he hates, as we just saw in some detail, is very much related to the fact that he loves us so much. We talked about that in detail yesterday. The reason that he hates is because he loves us so much. He hates wickedness, he hates evil, he hates suffering, he hates pain. And when one of his creatures is responsible for that kind of wickedness, then his reaction is described in the Bible as hatred. And if you're still uncomfortable with this, we're going to talk about it more in a few minutes, okay? So God's love is evaluative, not arbitrary and deterministic. Even Jesus himself was evaluatively loved by the Father. On at least three separate occasions, the Father said of Jesus, this is my Son in whom I, am, uh, whom I love, and then it says why, um, um, gives the rest of it. With him I am well pleased. This is my son, whom I love, with him I am well pleased. Now, if Jesus had disobeyed and rebelled against his father, would the father have been able to say, with him I am well pleased? No. God's love for his son was objectively evaluative. If Jesus had disobeyed and rebelled against the father, the father's reaction to him would have had to been different. So on what does God base his evaluation? Let's look at a few texts that tell us what God loves and then some of what God hates, all right? Isaiah 61, 8, For I, the Lord, love justice. I hate robbery and iniquity. Loves justice, hates robbery and iniquity. Psalm 33, 5, The Lord loves righteousness and justice. The earth is full of his unfailing love. So he loves righteousness and justice. Psalm 37, 28, for the Lord loves the just and will not forsake his faithful ones. So he, he loves the just and the faithful, he cuts off the wicked. Um, 2 Corinthians 9, 7. Each man should give what he has decided in his heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves what kind of a giver? A cheerful giver. God loves a cheerful giver. Psalm 5, 5. The arrogant cannot stand in your presence. You hate all who do wrong. So here God is hating those who do wrong. Revelation 2.6. But I, you have this in your favor. You hate the practices of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. The Nicolaitans, as best we can discover anyway, led lives of unrestrained indulgence. And God is saying, I hate that. Proverbs 11.20. The Lord detests men of perverse heart but he delights in those whose ways are blameless. He detests men of perverse heart. Jeff, in uh, Isaiah 61, 8, why does he use the word robbery in the scripture there? What is that uh, telling us? Robbery, is that, that if I rob somebody's money, is that, there must be a deeper meaning there. There probably is. Um, how about we look at it at the end if we've got some extra time? to make sure we get through this, but it's a good question. And I'd need to look it up and look at the context. Um, so he detests men of perverse heart. He doesn't just say he detests the perverseness of the heart. He detests men who have perverse hearts. Tony Lane points out that the, the cliche that God hates the sin but loves the sinner is actually kind of self-contradictory. He says it is incoherent to say that God is displeased with child molestation but feels no displeasure toward child molesters. It doesn't even work. 
When I hate a rotten peach, I don't just hate the rottenness, I hate the whole peach. I just get it away, get it away. That is an objective decision. I want nothing to do with that peach, even though, subjectively speaking, I still very much love peaches. And I would love to love that peach, if only it would be a good one. Right? We just saw over and over again that God loves the righteous and the just. But Romans 3.10 tells us that no one is righteous, not even one. Uh Uh-oh, we got a problem, right? And yet John 3.16 tells us that God loves everyone. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that... Who? Whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. So is this a contradiction? No. The answer is that God loves in a special, evaluative way. So God's love is conditional and unconditional in different ways. I remember when our professor came to this topic, he said God's love is, in some ways, conditional, and there was a collective gasp in the room. Pastors, theology, working on a master's degree, and everybody says, Ooh! God's love is sometimes conditional. So we're going to move into some dangerous ground here. I suppose we're already in it. I think this is an, an, an area where language is inadequate to really capture the nuances of how we should understand God's love. But what we are seeing here is that in one way, God's love is conditional. And before you throw me out... <laughs> Let's get through it, okay? It is true that God's love is unconditional, unconditional, and that he subjectively loves everybody. And and here's the perfect text to prove that, right? Romans 8, 35 to 39. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Right? Great text. Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword... As it is written, for your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither life, nor death, nor angels, nor demons, neither the present, nor the future, nor any powers, neither height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen? Amen. So, from God's subjective viewpoint... His love for all of his creatures is unconditional. But if we are going to deal honestly with all of Scripture, we cannot stop there. We've got to deal with passages like Exodus 25 and 6. You shall not bow down to them or worship them, for I, the Lord, the God, am a jealous God punishing those children for the sin of the fathers to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. He will punish those who hate him and show love to those who love him. Or Deuteronomy 7, 12 and 13. If you pay attention to these laws and are careful to follow them, Then the Lord your God will keep his covenant of love with you as he swore to your forefathers. He will love you and bless you and increase your numbers. So if we obey him, then he will keep his covenant of love with us. If If we don't, he won't. John 14, 21. Up there I have 23. What's... Oh, I think I missed one on the, on the PowerPoint. Oh, let's go to 1423 then. Jesus replied, If anyone loves me, he will obey my teaching. My Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. So if anyone loves me, he will obey my teaching, and my Father will love him. The, the opposite of that is, if you don't, he won't, right? John 15, 14. Oh, there's John 14, 21. I switched them around. Whoever has my commands and obeys them, he is the one who loves me. He who loves me will be loved. Get that? He who loves me will be loved, and I too will love him and show myself to him. John 15, 14. You are my friends. When? If 
you do what I command. The same went for Jesus himself. In John 10, 17, he said, The reason my Father loves me is that I lay down my life. That's the reason my Father loves me. I lay down my life. Only to take it up again. Jesus was being obedient to his Father, and this was one of the reasons that his Father loved him. From the opposite side, when we do not obey God, he hates us. Hosea 9, 15, Because of all their wickedness in Gilgal, I hated them there. Right? We just saw that one. Jeremiah 16, 5, For this is what the Lord says, Do not enter a house where there is a funeral meal. Do not go to mourn or show sympathy, because I have withdrawn my blessing, my love, and my pity from this people. I've withdrawn it. I've taken it away. Ooh. What do we do with these kind of texts if we say that God's love is absolutely unconditional? What do we do with them? The answer must be that actually God's love is not unconditional. Actually, it is for conditional. God's love is for conditional. That means love is his default mode. In other words, God's God freely offers his love to absolutely everyone, but his love comes with conditions. It's like God gives us a bank account full of love. It's yours. But you have to accept it and you have to follow the conditions that he has given for continued access to that bank account of love. It is for conditional. Objectively speaking, God's love is conditional. So we can lose God's love. But that is based on our choices, not on God's choice for us. If we want it, it's ours. You got it? If we want it, it is ours. Nothing can separate us from that love except our choice. Everybody clear? Yes, God will continue to love us with his subjective love, even if we refuse his objective love. He does not force us, though, to take it. He will not force us to accept even his love. 